Jesus' name, welcome to Trinity Lutheran Church because today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is. It is a beautiful day and it's a beautiful time for us to come together to share in God's word with one another. One announcement that we wanted to make sure that you are aware of includes today we'll have an intergenerational event called a Beach Bash, which we will meet at a lake home with lake property, and we'll have the opportunity for food, for fellowship, for devotion, and just a chance to gather as the body of Christ and have fun with one another and support one another through laughter and listening and talking and getting to know each other better. So know that you're invited, and if you need any details, um, please just send us a message, whether that's through Facebook or um, connecting with us via text, and we'll make sure that you have the information that you need. Exactly. What a fun way to come together in these summer months to have fun at the lake. So my friends, with all that being said, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
I invite you now into our time of confession and forgiveness. God, we hear your invitation to us. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy burdened. I will give you rest. We acknowledge our soul's need for rest and quiet nourishment. We lay down our burdens. We acknowledge our soul's need of connection with you. We confess our tendency to overlook rest as a necessary part of soul and self-care. We confess our pride in thinking that our work is so important that we may not set it down. We confess our readiness to believe that what we do determines our worth. We confess our obsession with productivity, results, measurable progress. We confess our tendency to forget that it is in you that we live and move and have our being and that your love is better than life. We ask now for body, mind, spirit, whole person nourishment. For rest and resurrection, for new life, for healing and consolation of our souls. We ask for help in managing our time and our activities so that our infillings keep up with our outpourings. Where we have overspent ourselves, refresh us. Where we have misplaced our priorities, rearrange us. Where we have said yes when we should have said no, remind us. We thank you for meaningful work, for blessings and burdens. We thank you for rest. May we become present to our great need for daily bread, the presence of Christ in our lives. Amen. Amen. Hear the good news. The good news of peace and salvation. God forgives us all our sins, not through our own works, but through Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Rejoice in this amazing gift of grace. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Welcome to our children message this morning. We recognized that Jesus walked on water and today many of us will be out on the lake. So we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity to reflect on Jesus walking on water, something that neither you or I or any human can do. Only in January. That's right, when it's frozen. But this is not when the water is no, frozen. No, it isn't. So let's listen in. The disciples were just waking up on their boat. They had been out on the water all night. Yawn. They were tired. (sighs) Stretch. It was so early, the sun wasn't even up yet. Andrew rubbed his eyes and looked into the fog. Hey, he whispered, do you see what I see? Oh, it's a ghost. James cried out in fear. The disciples were shaking in their sandals. They were terrified. Through the fog, they could see the outline of a person walking on the water. It was Jesus. Don't be afraid. It's just me, Jesus said. He waved a friendly hello. If it's really you, Jesus, tell me to walk on water, Peter said bravely. Okay, Jesus shrugged. Come on out, Peter. The water is fine. Gulp. Peter swallowed hard. He placed one foot onto the water. He's got his toes on the water. Plop. It didn't go under. He tried the other foot. Plop. He was standing. He kept his eyes glued on Jesus as he took a few careful steps. He walked faster and faster, splish, splash. Only his feet were getting wet. Jesus smiled at him. Peter felt the wind blowing on his face. He took his eyes off of Jesus and looked up at the dark clouds. He felt afraid. Uh Uh-oh. His ankles were wet. Uh Uh-oh. His knees were wet. Uh Uh-oh. Peter was sinking. Help me, Jesus. Save me, he yelled. Jesus reached out his hand and pulled Peter out of the sea. What did you stop? Why did you stop looking at me? Jesus asked, holding tightly to his friend. Don't you trust me? The wind stopped. They climbed into the boat full of cheering disciples. Hooray, this proves it, they said. You really are the son of God. From that day on, the disciples were excited to tell everyone they met about the power of Jesus. Wow, that's an exciting story, Pastor Eric. Can you imagine if you were out in the middle of a lake and all of a sudden you saw somebody walking towards you like Peter did with Jesus, right? And then Jesus says, come on, come out here, walk with me. Right, I would have been skeptical, I think. I would have been very skeptical because I can't swim. And you're not really sure what's going on, but 
This is one of those mysteries of the power of Jesus recognizing that he was fully human, but he was also fully God. Exactly. And so Jesus can do things like that. And for us to put our trust in him is so important because that is what our faith is about. Because of our trust in Jesus and his, our faith in him and his faithfulness to each of us. Exactly. You know, Pastor Eric, <clears throat> we read this story and we, we think about the theme of the story as being the ability to walk on water, but really the, the hidden lesson to this is not the fact of walking on water, but the fact of trusting in Jesus. When we find ourselves in situations where we don't know what to do or where to go or what's happening, trust that Jesus is there for us. Trust that God is with us through Jesus to help us um, do difficult things. And especially if we're dealing with a challenging time or any pain or suffering, exactly. we know that Jesus is with us, and we just have to trust him and recognize that that's important. Exactly. So this afternoon when we do the beach bash, if uh, at any time you see somebody walking on the water, take a picture. Yeah. Well, most likely I won't be able to do that. True. <laughs> okay. Friends, enjoy this day, and if you come on out to the beach this afternoon, may we have a wonderful time together. Amen. Our first reading for this 14th of July Sunday is coming from Amos, chapter 7, verses 7 through 15. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with a sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away from the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from the following flock. And the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Here ends the first reading. Our second reading is coming from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasures of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that has lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to good pleasures that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him things in heaven, and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, 
so that we, who were the first to set our hopes on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Here ends the second reading. The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee, when his daughter Herodias came in. And dance, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. King was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, O Christ. Christ. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the word moral as of or relating to principles of right and wrong. More dilemmas in life exist when we encounter decisions between what is right and what is wrong. Now, dilemmas can be simple, complex, or even unexpected. Thankfully, our Christian faith can teach us how to interact with the world every day of our lives, despite the challenging scenarios we may experience. Our faith can provide us courage and comfort connected to the gospel and the kingdom of God when the world can deliver judgment and skepticism in the face of adversity. Small daily right and wrong moral decisions can include the following. When I grew up as a young boy, I remember shopping with my dad and shopping with my mom, oftentimes separate and the reason for that was because of where my dad liked to shop. Most often would be places like Home Depot or Lowe's or Ace Hardware or Sears or a parts store. My mom shopped differently, but I remember specifically when shopping with my dad, he would purchase things oftentimes with cash, and they would give him change, and then he would put that change in his pocket and as he filled up his pocket, you could hear jingle, jangle when he walked. We would get out to the car, as typically would shop with the boys, meaning my two younger brothers and myself. And he would, before leaving the parking lot, look at the receipt and make sure he got the exact change back. And sometimes he would realize that he was given an extra penny back that wasn't his to take. So we would march back in the store behind him, and he would say, 
Unfortunately, you gave me too much back in return. Here is your penny. All right, boys, let's go home. And we would have an extra walk, which would sometimes take 10 to 15 minutes extra just to give that one penny back. Now, there was another side of the coin regarding shopping with dad because sometimes they would give him back a Canadian quarter. We wouldn't realize it again until after we left and made it all the way back to the car, reviewing the receipt, looking at his change. And then all of a sudden, he saw a Canadian quarter versus an American quarter, which at the time was worth less than the American quarter in value. So what did that mean? Typically would happen like this, where I'd be like, oh no, here we go. Boys would march back in behind dad. And he would explain to oftentimes a teenager or a young person behind the cash register that he was given a Canadian quarter. He said, what do you mean a Canadian quarter? Because sometimes they didn't know what that was. And said, no, I, I just want an American quarter. So eventually, once we got that all settled, we'd go back and follow him into the car and go home. But it was about not only doing the right thing in those situations, but modeling and teaching us boys at the time to do the right thing even when it was inconvenient and it doesn't even seem to make a large impact in the world, but you still do it anyways. And it worked. I remember those life lessons even to this day. And there are also more decisions that have larger implications, such as when the main character, Charlie, finds himself in during the 1992 Oscar award-winning movie, Scent of a Woman. Set the scene, there are three main characters. We've got Charlie Sims, who is a high school student, and he was an intelligent kid, but was not wealthy and had limited power and resources. However, he lived a life of integrity. And then there was retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Frank Slade, who goes by Frank throughout the movie. He had a morally questionable personality and career, as he was blinded while juggling grenades, while intoxicated on duty. And then we have Charlie's friends, who came from affluent families, were troublemakers who could get away with almost anything, who lived lives of dishonesty. Now, I won't ruin the whole movie for you if you haven't seen it, but I will provide a couple of highlights to emphasize the moral dilemma that unfolds throughout the film connected to a summary provided by the internet movie database known as IMDb. So here we go. In the beginning, Charlie and his friend, George, witnessed several students setting up a prank for the school's principal, Mr. Trask. And following the prank, Trask, the principal, presses Charlie and George to divulge the names of the perpetrators. Trask offers a bribe, a letter of recommendation that would virtually guarantee Charlie's acceptance to Harvard if he tells on those who did it. And Charlie remained silent but conflicted during that time of the movie. Next, Charlie helps Frank, the other main character I described earlier, who was blind, and he takes him on a vacation in New York City, really escorts him for money, so he can have enough to go home to visit, visit family for Christmas later on. So he spends time with this retired Army Lieutenant Colonel. And as they return to New York, Charlie confides in Frank and tells him about his complications at school. Now Frank, our morally questionable character, advises Charlie to tell on his classmates and go to Harvard who cares? The other kids won't get in trouble. Take care of yourself because they sure won't. Upon the return to school, Charlie and George are subjected to a formal inquiry in front of the student body and the student faculty disciplinary committee in the school's auditorium because they won't tell who did it. And Frank is in, in attendance and can't contain his silence any longer during these deliberations and launches into a passionate speech defending Charlie in front of the entire school, the principal, the committee, and everyone, and states the following in a speech. 
As I came in here, I heard those words, cradle of leadership. Well, when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and it has fallen here. It has fallen. Makers of men, creators of leaders, be careful what kind of leaders you're producing here. I don't know if Charlie's silence here today is right or wrong. I'm not a judge or jury, but I can tell you this. He won't sell anybody out to buy his future. And that, my friends, is called integrity. That's called courage. And that's the stuff leaders should be made of. Now, I've come to the crossroads in my life. I always knew what the right path was. Without exception, I knew, but I never took it. You know why? It was too darn hard. Now here's Charlie. He's come to the crossroads. He has chosen a path. It's the right path. It's a path made of principle that leads to character. Let him continue on his journey. You hold this boy's future in your hands, committee. It's a valuable future. Believe me, don't destroy it. Protect it. Embrace it. It's going to make you proud someday. I promise you. And Frank also calls out the perpetrators for not coming forward. George for his cowardice and selling out his friends, which happens. And Trask for his hypocrisy by talking about the school's morals while punishing students for defending their classmates and rewarding snitches. And tells everyone about the bribe that was provided to Charlie, which happened to be from the principal. Disciplinary committee decides to place the students named by George on probation, deny George recognition and accommodation for his testimony, and excuse Charlie from any punishment to loud applause from the student body except for George and the perpetrators. A great ending to a challenging moral dilemma. Now, our gospel reading today presents us with another moral dilemma involving King Herod, his wife Herodias, their daughter, and John the Baptist. A couple of helpful details to rev review. Herodias, King Herod's wife, has a grudge against John the Baptist because he told King Herod not to marry her. King Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man who spread the good news of Jesus. And the moral dilemma unfolds at King Herod's birthday party when King Herod says to his daughter at the party in front of all their guests, ask me for whatever you wish and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half my kingdom. The daughter went out and asked her mom, what should I ask for? And her answer was the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back in and requested to her father, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her, and John was beheaded. The moral dilemma includes, should King Herod save face in front of his guests, take the easier path, honor the immoral request of his daughter, and protect his self-interest? Or should King Herod look foolish and weak in front of his guests, take the harder path, and deny the immoral request of his daughter to behead John the Baptist, the holy and righteous man, and not protect any of his own self-interests? King Herod clearly chose to save face, take the easier path, honor the immoral request of his daughter, and protect his self-interest, as the theologian Vitalis Hoffman writes, that worldly wisdom always suggests that you be cautious, reasonable, and look out for yourself. Keep your options open. Avoid commitments that may later get you stuck. Stay calm. Don't lose your head. Literally. However, kingdom of God wisdom includes being like John the Baptist, who was uncompromising in speaking the word given to him, following Jesus and his teachings, such as the golden rule that states, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. Regardless of the worldly 
consequences. King Herod isn't the only one with a moral dilemma when determining whether a person should live or die in the Gospel of Mark. Pontius Pilate will also be faced with a similar situation. He is recorded as acknowledging Jesus' innocence, but wishing to satisfy the crowd, he concedes and orders Jesus' execution. Thanks be to God that when people choose wrong, through God's abounding grace, God can still make things right no matter when humans choose to look out for their own interests and not treat others as they want to be treated. Lastly, more dilemmas can happen when you least expect them, such as on a Friday evening around 5 p.m., when the phone rings and you're about to head home for the day and you're informed that a person is without a home, without food. There are no openings in any local homeless shelters. The nearest available shelter is in Grand Forks, North Dakota, and there are no buses to that place for the next three days. No Pelican motels have vacancy, and there are 81 on the list for help to secure housing. 81. 80 people in front of them. And you get to ask yourself, what do you do? Do you say no? Sorry, you can't help because you know it will take a minimum of a couple of hours to figure out. Or do you commit to doing the right thing? Unfortunately, because of two families, one from Trinity, another from Calvary, they made the moral right decision, took the harder path, quickly finished eating supper, opened up the food shelf to get them food, found people to help them watch their children, delivered them to a local affordable hotel in Fergus, and helped them get to their next appointment on Monday morning. Clearly, living a moral life connected to our faith is not easy. But it is the right thing to do, and these types of decisions and behaviors will absolutely make our world a better place to live. Now, I can't stand up here and tell each of you that if you make the right decisions during life's moral dilemmas you encounter, it will always result in a perfect case scenario and conclusion, meaning you'll be proven right and other entities will be seen as wrong. Things will go your way precisely the way you want them to, like Charlie's case in the movie, and life will be convenient and easy while doing so, because that is absolutely not always the case. As we heard about concerning John the Baptist and how his life ended with his beheading, or even with Jesus' death on the cross, even though he was completely innocent. However, I can proclaim to each of you the gospel, the eternal living word of God, and the good news Jesus brings to each of us that can bring us comfort, peace, strength, and healing, no matter what happens in our lives and even during the moral dilemmas we may face. And when you do make the right moral decisions in life and follow the golden rule Jesus teaches, and everything do to others as you would have them do to you, know you are living in ways connected to the eternal kingdom of God. You can sleep at night knowing you are doing the right thing, and you will make the world a better place for you and others, as Jesus taught and modeled for us all during his life and ministry. And that, my friends, is good news. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. You gather your people into the body of Christ, where your church is wounded, heal it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is divided, reunite it. In your mercy, hear our prayer. From before the foundation of the world, you are God. Revive our ecosystems destroyed by human greed. Curb our desires to put wealth ahead of the health of all who call this planet home. In your mercy, hear our prayer. You established equity and make justice within every nation, tribe, and land. Cause laws to be written and customs to be observed that protect the most vulnerable. In your mercy, hear our prayer. On the cross, your beloved Son endured pain and death. Bring healing to those in need, hope to any in despair, and comfort to the dying. In your mercy, hear our prayer. You send your light into this community of faith. Empower our ministries that serve and build up local communities. Nurture our partnerships with other community organizations. In your mercy, hear our prayer. All peoples praise you, O God. We give you thanks and praise for the lives of our loved ones who now rest in you. In the fullness of time, gather us with all your saints in light. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, into your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us all embrace each other in Christ's reconciling peace. God's peace, Pastor Eric. Peace be with you, Alan. God's peace be with each of you. At this time, let us give thanks for the offering we receive to proclaim Christ through word and deed here in Pelican Rapids, the state of Minnesota, our country, and beyond. Let us pray. Merciful God, we, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, my friends, as we come to the close of this service, as you go out into the remainder of this day and into this new week, go with this blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your backs. May the sun shine warm upon your faces and the rains fall gentle upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen.
as we go forth this Sunday, we invite all of us to be nourished by the word through listening, through singing, and knowing that it will empower us to go out and spread the good news with everyone we encounter. So go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Have a blessed Sunday, everyone. See you next week. God bless.